Good evening, and welcome to tonight's forum on Black maternal health. My name is Rose Pierre-Louis, and I am the Executive Director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at NYU. Let me begin by first thanking our lead organizers, the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx, which I'm very proud to be a member of, One Brooklyn Health, and NYU McSilver for their leadership in planning this forum. I'd also like to extend my thanks to our community partners and their leadership, the Black Policy Lab, Pink Cornrows, and their founder, Ify Yike, the Hope Center, and Executive Director, Dr. Lena Green, the New York Urban League, and its CEO, Arva Rice, our colleagues at NYU Myers College of Nursing, the North Manhattan Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and Chapter President Laasia Hunley, Delta Sigma Theta's New York Metropolitan Coordinating Council, and all of its participating chapters and chapter presidents, and I'm very proud to also be a member of Delta Sigma Theta. The Tau Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and Chapter President Michelle Hardy. The Delta Alpha Zeta Chapter of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority and Chapter President Heather DeLeon. I'd also like to take the time right now to acknowledge the President of the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx, Leslie Horton Campbell. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Ebony K. Williams, who is a humanitarian, lawyer, author of the newly released book, Bet on Black, and I like to describe her as a force of nature. Ebony is a veteran of news broadcasting with prior roles on Fox News, CNN, HLN, and Revolt TV. Ebony currently hosts a nightly news show on the GRIO, and she's the executive producer of the NAACP Image Award nominating podcast, Holding Court with Ebony K. Williams. Ebony, it's so great to see you and thank you for agreeing to serve as our moderator. I know you've been traveling abroad and we are just thrilled for your support. And I turn the floor over to you. Well, Rose, fresh off of my travels from Mumbai, I greet you with namaste. I see the God in you. Um, Rose, I just want to thank you for your leadership always. Um, It is my honor and uh, distinguished pleasure to share this very, very, very important conversation tonight. Um, I want to thank each and every one of our esteemed panelists that we will be hearing from tonight. Uh, I want to thank all of the event sponsors that Rose uh, talked about And I want to thank you, uh, our audience, for joining us tonight. Um, We are just so excited to see such engagement with a very critical issue that affects uh, Black women and Black families all across our country. The reality is that this is very personal to me. Um, I am speaking from a place of a Black woman who is embarking on a single motherhood journey myself. I'm in the midst of that process. And so it has never been more real for me uh, to really start thinking about the risks associated with attempting to give birth in America as a black woman. The statistics on black maternal health are sobering. They are stark. They are really unconscionable. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, nationally, black women die almost three times almost three times as often as our white female counterparts. And in New York City, that number goes up to four times as likely as white women, black women succumb to childbirth. I really think that we have to sit with the fact that black women, and this is a very important issue when it comes to this black um, maternal health conversation, even controlling for education and income levels, Black women are still faced with disproportionate death and gaps of care. It's very difficult 
to uh, to talk about the scope of this and not talk about the numbers. I have to tell you that the Centers for Disease Control reported just this past March that overall maternal mortality rates nearly doubled between 2017 and 2021. That makes it the highest it's ever been since 1965. Globally, just to put this in kind of a global um, perspective, the United States ranks just above Iran, but we are far, far, far worse than Saudi Arabia, our neighbors in Canada, Japan, and Germany. Again, when we look at these numbers holistically, we have to see that there is an ongoing crisis in America when it comes to Black maternal health. And we know that the maternal health of Black women impacts the direct and overall holistic health of Black America. With that as our framework for this evening's conversation, let's begin. I want to introduce our esteemed uh, experts that will serve as our panelists this evening. Um, the reality is what we know is that Black women have been suffering generation after generation when it comes to this issue and this challenge and the consequences of the disparities between health care for Black women in America. That disparity is often rooted in everything from unconscious bias uh, to historical imprints and frankly, just downright anti-Blackness. And we know again that Black women have felt this generation after generation since our arrival on this very land. So the focus can be around negative outcomes, around physical health, but it's very important, and we're going to talk about it tonight, that the mental health component of the ma uh, maternal um, issues that are going on uh, are very, very important as well. We have got to give that the attention that it deserves, and we will do that tonight. Our panelists do serve on the very front lines of this issue. Uh, they are dealing with Black maternal health in every way, and they are central to solving this crisis. They know the firsthand challenges because they are in these spaces day in and day out. They have in various ways dedicated themselves uh, to identifying the issue, but also solving and finding solutions. Um, solutions that are both individual in nature and of course communal. Most importantly, we are joined tonight by leaders who go beyond Again, talking about the issue, that is extremely important. That's why we're having this conversation tonight. But our panelists are in the trenches and they are developing action items, solutions that actually work to end this crisis in Black America. This is an indeed a community tonight, y'all. This is not a lecture. Uh, so I really, really, really want you to feel invited and encouraged to participate. We want to hear from you. I want you all to think as we are engaging in each one of these topical panel conversations, if, as you have questions, please, please, please use your chat box, um, the Q&A box specifically at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in there and I will absolutely be getting to as many of them as possible um, as we uh, get to the end of our conversation tonight. I'm very, very excited to hear what you all are thinking about, what comes up for you as we have these conversations. So please utilize the Q&A uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to start this by, uh, again, setting an overview, a framework of the Black maternal health crisis here in America and how it shows up today. Uh, we'd like to welcome our first panel, and I'm going to, um, you know, introduce each of them. Um, we're so, so, so honored to be joined by these fantastic experts uh, in this, this work. First, Dr. Cyrus McCalla. Uh, he is the chairman of um, obstetrics and gynecology at One Brooklyn Health. Uh, Dr. McCalla, thank you so much for being with us. We also have Chanel Portia Albert. Uh, she is the founder and chief executive director of Ancient Song Doula Services, which is headquartered in Brooklyn, New York. And we have Dr. Courtney James. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner and a postdoctoral fellow with the National Clinician Scholars Program at the University of California in Los Angeles. And Dr. James is joining us from sunny LA. We appreciate you being with this time difference, <laughs> Dr. James. Um, 
Welcome to each and every one of you. Again, we want to start with an overview, right? Let's set uh, a premise here so we all understand what we're going to unpack tonight. Um, I'd like to start by having each of you uh, briefly, just in a couple of minutes, talk about your work, talk about um, how in your specific vertical of your work, you address the challenges that Black women face in assessing and receiving and accessing health care during the perinatal period, the perinatal. And maybe let's start, if you don't mind, Dr. Um, Cyrus McCullough, start by even defining uh, what the uh, perinatal period is. I think we hear a lot about the prenatal period, but what is the perinatal period? And let's talk from there. Well, the um, perinatal period starts uh, even before pregnancy, pre-pregnancy, which is an extremely important period. Uh, for women or risk, especially women with diabetes, women with hypertensive disease. And it's very important to get these medical issues under control, even before conception, before conceiving, getting a regular checkup, making sure your blood sugars are under control uh, before pregnancy. Prenatal care is also extremely important. So once you're once you get pregnant, having regular follow-up, making sure that all aspects of your health are being addressed. You know, not only um, nutrition, exercise, but if there are underlying medical issues, that these are also addressed and taken care of. So, and of course, uh, intrapartum or during a labor and delivery, that's also very important because there are issues uh, that can got, come up at that time that will need to be addressed. Issues such as um, bleeding during pregnancy, which is one of the big cause of uh, maternal mortality. There are also cardiovascular problems that can occur during this time. So it's very important to have individuals who are taking care of you work capable of addressing these issues. And if the individual who is directly responsible for your care um, is not capable of addressing those issues, it's important to have a consultants who are readily available to step in and address some of these issues that can come up um, during uh, the labor and delivery process. And of course, it does not end there. Postpartum is also extremely important. 50% of maternal mortality occurs after delivery of the baby. So getting a close follow-up post-delivery, especially if you're at risk, if you're at risk for hypertensive disease, for you know, clot formation, developing pulmonary emboli, for example, cardiovascular disease, it's very important to have that follow-up. And uh, what has been done, uh, especially from our national body, American College of OBGYN, they have actually recommended early uh, postpartum care, not waiting for six weeks for that postpartum follow-up. So th there are a, a number of uh, uh, intervention uh, so to speak, to address this issue of uh, maternal mortality and severe morbidity. Thank you, Dr. McCullen. I'm so, so very glad that you mentioned that part about um, the fact that half of the uh, Black women who uh, die uh, during uh, this, this childbirthing experience happens after the child is born. A lot of times that's missed in this conversation. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, Ms. Portia Albert, I would love to hear um, from your work uh, in the community, uh, specifically your role uh, in as a doula. And, and I think we're starting to hear and learn much more about what doulas uh, mean to community birthing opportunities. Please speak to what you see Black women um, particularly struggling with when it comes to access and care. Yeah, um, thank you um, for, for bringing forward that question. Um, well, first, I really want to start with like, I know the conversation can be really heavy and, you know, I'm not sure we may have audience participants who are viewing right now who are actually pregnant, um, who are parenting, um, maybe you are supporting someone who is pregnant. And so while this information is being presented in such a way that 
is highlighting some of the difficulties and the challenges that individuals may be facing. I do want to also lift up joy um, in that aspect of that there are also individuals who are actively working to really center um, beautiful birthing experiences who are really um, trying to offer continuity of care and change the dynamic that is currently happening within Black maternal health um, for Black women and birthing people. And so, you know, as a doula who, you know, is working with in the intersections of chronic health um, conditions, as well as the social determinants of health, you know, we see a, a myriad of things that can occur, right? Such as, um, you know, someone who maybe you have high housing insecurity, right? And you are trying to access healthcare services and not necessarily knowing what your options can be in that situation. Um, you may have maybe experiencing insurance segregation. And a lot of folks don't think about you know, access to and, and the role that insurance plays in someone accessing health care. Um, someone who is relying on state-based Medicaid, um, you know, may find themselves in um, a crunch hole of not feeling like they have a lot of options of where they can go. Or when those options are presented to them, not feeling like they are speaking to their needs or really affirming what it is that they're saying to themselves um, and to their provider. And so, you know, a lot of it is uh, centered on resource base um, and really feeling affirmed in those resources. Um, you know, feeling like there's no true informed consent um, when accessing healthcare services, um, and um, just not feeling like you're you're being seen or heard. You know, and so, um, and 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 this, you know, as Dr. Um, McCalla brought up, you know, just thinking about the postpartum period. You know, some of the pre biggest pre pregnancy related complications are happening during that postpartum period. Um, and really, you know, what happens when the individual then has to one of these complications arise, they go into the ER, they're saying this is what's happening to me physically. This is what I'm feeling. I know that something's off, but they're not being listened to and, they're, and that feeling is dismissed. Right. Um, or is brushed away as, oh, those are just common signs and symptoms of someone who, you um, is going through the postpartum period. And so, you know, I think it is a, a combination of not feeling like they're seen or heard, a combination of um, lack of adequate resources that are culturally con congruent um, and humble, um, and then connecting the dots to understanding that it's not just about the implications of an episode of pregnancy, but what does that mean um, you know, to extend, to really so, to offer those social supports to the individual who's seeking services. Very holistic and very community um, framed. Um, so I really appreciate that, um, Ms. Portia Albert. And I want to also just kind of speak to, uh, uh, many of us uh, are hearing doula and midwife and these other kind of additional, you know, um, roles of, of opportunity for childbirthing experiences, um, some of us for the first time, and, and you, you're talking about advocacy, right? And, and the role that doulas and, and other community members like yourself can play in terms of being heard, being represented, and, and making sure that our needs are being, um, are being recognized. So thank you for that. Dr. James, I do want to ask you, um, Ms. Portia Albert mentioned the word joy. Um, because this stuff is heavy and it's and it's it's dense and it can feel very layered. Um, and yet there is still joy in this. And we talk a lot about the physical manifestations of the challenges of maternal health, but there are many, many, many mental health concerns as well. Can you speak to uh, the interconnectivity of, of both the physical and the mental as it comes to this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chanel really set me up good for this uh, section. So I appreciate you. Um, Often we're inundated with like the negative health outcomes that affect black women and birthing people. And so we think about all these statistics related to death and severe complications, um, their symptoms and concerns being ignored and even receiving poor quality of care. And so this negative rhetoric in the zeitgeist of black pregnancy and birthing outcomes negatively affects their mental health. And so the oxymoron of this time in life that traditionally in African-American culture is sacred and filled with love and joy is surrounded by this shroud of darkness or gloom and doom. And so this causes some to experience fear, anxiety, depression during their pregnancy, if they even choose to become pregnant. 
I have cared for pregnant people, spoken with them in research, and even have friends who are deathly afraid to become pregnant for fear of dying. Then if you add the overall discriminatory or racist experiences that Black women and people capable of pregnancy experience, sometimes on a day-to-day basis, um, living in a racialized society, that we may not only experience personally, but may witness others experience through various media and social platforms. We know this constant exposure to discrimination and other negative determinants of health known as weathering affects our physical health. But there's also the mental stress that takes a toll on our mental well-being because of these various stressors. And so this may show up as hypervigilance, silencing one's voice to avoid discrimination, anxiety and depression once again. And so the mental health can affect the physical health and vice versa, and therefore should be a focus for us all um, to consider all these ways that Black women and birthing people's uh, mental health is impacted and ensure that we support joy uh, in Black pregnancy and birth. Amen. You know, it's interesting, uh, Dr. James, when I share with my prime, no, no, my OBGYN, who is a Black woman, Dr. Um, Michelle Francis, that I was uh, going on this single motherhood by choice journey. She was very excited for me. But one of the very first things she recommended, along with the physical um, care, was that I make sure that I get back into my therapy regime. Um, just because of a lot of different factors, everything that you named, the inherent nature of being a black pregnant woman in America. And also, um, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly a a medical spring chicken, you know, I'll be 40 years old (laughs) this, uh, this September. And, um, (laughs) you know, I've got to tell the truth about it. And, um, you know, I will be one of those geriatric mothers, God willing. Um, and she talked about the increased risk potentially of postpartum and things like that. So I really appreciate you highlighting the importance of identifying and trying to get in front of those issues of anxiety, fear, and depression as well. Okay, so between those three um, incredible foundational takes as to kind of wrapping our head around what we're really trying to unpack here tonight, um, I wanna go to the next phase of this conversation. uh, And that is gonna be really around best practices. What do best practices look like as we start trying to solve for these elements of crisis, uh, making it no longer the case that Black women are dying three times as likely as white women in childbirth? And here in New York City, I just want to be clear, that number goes from three to four times more likely. Um, I also want to introduce two uh, additional panelists that are going to help us round out some of the best practices part of the conversation. Dr. Torian Easterling. He is Senior Vice President for Population and Community Health, as well as Chief Strategic and Innovation Officer with One Brooklyn Health. I want to um, thank you so much, Dr. Easterling. Dr. Easterling, I believe that we um, were on a panel together during COVID around vaccination. Yes, it's great to see you again, brother. And also Ms. Roxanne Monroe. Um, Ms. Monroe is Program Director uh, of Healthy Families Brookdale with One Brooklyn Health. Uh, Ms. Monroe, thank you so much for joining us as well. So when we talk about best practices, again, we're trying to get to some, how do we solve these things? How do we make it safer for Black women to, to give birth in this country and uh, safer for their children as well? Um, Ms. Monroe, I want to start with you. Oh, also, audience, please know I'd be here all night uh, talking about the innate and lengthy accolades of these brilliant minds. Check the chat. Please look into their full bios. They are all there, including roses. So you can have a better understanding of the full scope of these uh, brilliant people's expertise. And you can add those to your questions. Put those questions in the chat, please. All right, uh, Dr. Uh, Easterling, I wanna ask uh, you first. You are a nationally recognized public health figure. When you talk about this issue of Black maternal health and unfortunately uh, what can be Black maternal mortality, what are ways that you think the community can show up uh, for Black women? How do we get in front of this issue in a better way? How do we promote more honest uh, and complete dialogue so that we can help solve this crisis? Uh, It's a pleasure to be joining you all this evening. Uh, It's such an important topic uh, and certainly uh, to be joining this esteemed panel um, and, and certainly thank you to the McSilver Institute uh, for hosting uh, this, um, this event. Uh, I think that the question is certainly important because uh, as we are, uh, you know, coming out of uh, the pandemic, dealing with COVID-19, 
dealing with all of the different, um, you know, sort of intersecting crises, uh, the racial reckoning, dealing with RSV, influenza, and so forth and so on. I think top of mind, uh, we're certainly uh, having to uh, to figure out, you know, how we're having conversations about uh, health and well-being. Um, this is a this is a topic that's been, um, you know, certainly top of mind for for some years. And so, you know, you have leaders who are on this this call who have been really pushing uh, this conversation. Um, just to give you a, a really concrete example of why it's so important uh, to listen to community, to listen to individuals with lived experience. Um, you know, I came into the health department in 2015. Uh, that was shortly uh, a couple of years after uh, the health department made um, a commitment uh, to really supporting doulas, uh, to expanding the model, um, and so, you know, I really had a fortunate uh, opportunity to participate in where we are right now. I mean, it's amazing for us to be talking about policy and expanding certification and really making sure that our hospitals have doulas. Um, and I, I do want to lift up, um, you know, the work of Chanel Portia Albert, uh, because the health department doesn't even exist with having a By My Side, a citywide doula initiative, if it wasn't for the advocacy of, of Chanel. Um, you know, you know, I came in and folks were, were literally like, uh, should we be supporting doulas? Uh, is that something uh, that we uh, should even be thinking about? Why are we even investing uh, in that? You know, and I think, you know, Chanel could certainly speak to that experience um, because she was there and certainly walking into rooms and people not holding space uh, for, you know, our leaders, for our community based organizations. And so we're here because of Chanel. Um, and, and I and I certainly uh, Pray Chanel and many others um, that are probably on this call uh, who've contributed to uh, you know a lot of the work that uh, uh, that's happening right now. So I think that you know I don't think you can get any more concrete about what New York City is doing and the, the type of investments that we made. Uh, the organizations. I mean, you're, you're talking about hundreds of doulas who've been trained, who've been placed, who who are being uh, supported, salary wise, and their families and the families uh, who are benefiting from having this emotional support uh, from, uh, from this workforce. Absolutely incredible. Um, I have to say, to just kind of amplify that point, uh, Dr. Easterling, I know as I go into my journey, I'm not even going to consider this journey without the support of a doula. Um, that just feels, uh, at this point as a Black woman in America, it feels like a requirement um, I'm really excited to say that um, probably directly due to your advocacy, Ms. Portia Albert, my uh, one of my chapter sorority members in Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, uh, Pi Kappa Omega chapter is being trained right now to be a doula. Um, so I am just thrilled to death by this advancement. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you, Ms. Monroe, uh, your work is centered in this uh, community advocacy aspect uh, amongst many other uh, components. Please talk to us about what our community members, what our family members even, um, mm -hmm. excuse me. They are vacuuming outside of my door. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but I guess cleanliness is next to godliness. Excuse that. Um, Ms. Monroe, please talk about what our community members and our family members can be doing in addition to uh, our medical care team to ensure the health and safety of black women. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to, um, find out what's available to you in your community. Um, you know, make sure that you're not isolated. Um, you know, that you have people who can advocate for you, that can provide you with um, vital information and support and connect you to services in the community. Um, so Healthy Families is a home visiting program. And many people, you know, birthing, women are not familiar with the resources that are available to them, that they can have someone come visit them in their home, um, you know, provide them with education, help them to understand what um, is expected when they go for a prenatal visit, prepare them with questions, um, you know, provide education on immunizations, um, their access to care, the, the choices that they have, um, you know, the ability to make decisions about their body and so on. Um, you know, speak to your local legislators about the services that are available in your, in your community. Um, if, if you 
receive services that were beneficial to you, advocate for it. Um, funding, you know, is provided and, and funding um, ends regularly and voices need to be heard so that people know what services are really beneficial to them in the community. Um, oh, there's so much more I can say. <laughs> but, you know, um, that's the best thing I can say, stay connected. Stay connected because there are services that are available and there are people that can connect you and advocate for you. Stay connected, stay in communication, uh, very much so. Dr. Eastling, I do want to um, go back to, to, to something that you said, and that really is talking about the kind of cyclical nature um, in which this uh, Black maternal health crisis finds itself in. Uh, we hear stories time and time again of Black women either they're there by themselves or oftentimes they're there with uh, their husbands. They're there with their mothers. Sometimes they're even there with their doulas and their family, and yet they're still not being heard. So some of this is also from the clinician side, right? Mm -hmm. What can be done in medical schools, in nursing schools, in clinician training to help remedy this issue as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is so important and so timely. Uh, I mean, there has to be uh, a reckoning with the way in which um, uh, medical school, nursing schools uh, really focus on this biomedical model. Uh, and that's just not sustainable, particularly for our communities. Um, you know, and I think that the way even that our system, as we're implementing this framework uh, for, for equity, as we start to think about what, uh, you know, our charges. And so one, I would say that we have to be intentional about embedding a racial and social justice lens into all the work that we do. Uh, and that means that we have to build capacity, have a shared vision, shared language about what it means to do anti-racism work. We have to be uncomfortable to get to a more comfortable space. Medical schools, nursing schools absolutely need to do the harm. And so then the next step is, how do we foster uh, transparency and really begin to do the work of redressing some of the harm that's been done? We know that many medical schools are in communities of color. Uh, there has been harm done. Uh, what commitment has been made 40 years ago, 50 years ago by medical schools? I graduated from Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in North New Jersey. Right now, we're celeb you know, we just came out of the Holy Week, you know, following the murder of Dr. King. In 1967, my medical school did a social contract with the city and said that we're going to make a commitment towards community health. If you look at the data, maternal health, those inequities still exist. Poverty still exists. Jail incarceration still exists. That social contract has not been delivered. And, and so we have to do a real reckoning where how medical schools have failed, nursing schools have failed to deliver on the communities that they're serving. And that's even for all of our healthcare systems as well. And I think that mm -hmm. commitment needs to be loud and clear. The American Medical Association, so the largest professional medical association has been a great model um, under the leadership of uh, their chief equity officer, the chief health equity officer, uh, Dr. Letha Maybank. And so, you know, several years ago, uh, they took that step of calling out the harm and how they uh, eliminated and, and restricted black physicians, black and brown physicians for even joining the American Medical Association. I mean, this this is the type of things that we have to be transparent about, about how that has led to the segregation of care, the disinvestment in our healthcare system, and ultimately uh, poor health outcomes in black and brown communities. And then, you know, the list goes on about how uh, the steps can be made. Um, the other thing I would say, one more, uh, and sorry for the train, but I would say the other thing to be really cognizant of is there are ways in which we can really re redesign our edu educational curriculum. And so medical schools, medical students, nursing students working with our doulas, with our midwives early on, right? And, and sort of uh, redistributing power, right, in those interprofessional spaces. And so the doctor isn't leading the conversation. We're having all diverse thoughts about what the care plan is for that individual and bringing the patient into that conversation. That's a total way of, th that's a total new way of thinking. And one of the things that we're doing here at One Brooklyn Health, uh, we're trying to design an innovation, an innovative curriculum uh, that will allow us to, to sort of think about an interdisciplinary model that would bring our community-based organizations, our faith-based organizations into a care team 
uh, with our residents, um, psychiatry residents, uh, with our medicine residents, our dental residents, to teach them about community organizing, to teach them about how we're addressing health inequities, moving more upstream and not just thinking about, well, you know, the downstream effects of risk and injury. And I think that's the direction that medicals have to really begin to think about if we're going to sort of think about the whole person of care. Uh, and I think those, I think there are medical schools and nursing schools that are beginning to go in that direction, but we have to be uh, truly intentional about those steps. Indeed. Um, real quick note, housekeeping for our audience members. Uh, we do apologize. The Q&A um, function's not working. So please still keep putting your questions in the chat. I've already seen some phenomenal questions go in there and we're going to get to those momentarily. Uh, Dr. Courtney James, I saw you nodding a lot uh, during Dr. Easterling's uh, commentary there. Um, you coming from an, an established uh, background and experience in your practice as a nurse practitioner, please, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what that um, kind of educational, clinician educational uh, reform uh, process could look like. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so many things. But I mean, Dr. Easterling pretty much said them all. I, I work with uh, medical schools and nursing schools to not only work on reforming their current practices, but also being aware of the history of the erasure of Black traditional and Indigenous midwives and how that uh, process and effort single-handedly sort of changed birthing care for Black women and birthing people in this country. Um, also, I think as far as like perinatal mental health, I explained earlier, you know, all the ways that Black women and people capable of pregnancy can be affected. And for the most part, our healthcare systems and clinicians aren't trained to respond to these racially sensitive um, factors that impact mental health. And so, you know, research estimates that anywhere from 20 up to 50% of Black women, uh, Black women specifically is the literature that I've read, uh, experience symptoms of what we call perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, but there are different estimates, but less than 15% receive medication or are connected to therapy. And often literature points to stigma and cultural beliefs that Black women and birthing people may have that you know, causes them to not seek or receive care. But we must also acknowledge the justified fear uh, that Black women and birthing people may have of being reported to the child welfare system for having mental health conditions, as well as lack of treatment options. Because, I mean, if medication or therapy is the only options that we support and based on insurance and affordability that may affect someone's uh, ability to actually utilize those options, as well as the lack of culturally congruent uh, mental health providers that you know, Chanel had mentioned earlier. And so part of my work and my research is to explore the ways that Black women and birthing people navigate and heal from emotional and mental health difficulties, whether that's during pregnancy or after childbirth. Um, and then how can clinicians and healthcare systems in general better support them? And of course, yes, there are screening tools to detect these mood disorders, but how do we respond to and support Black women and people capable of pregnancy holistically to consider all the ways their mental health is impacted, not just hormonally? So again, how do we support joy in Black pregnancy, birth, and, and parenting? Um, and I would suggest providing tailored holistic support to those um, experiencing these difficulties and I know there will be resources provided, but one of my favorites is Therapy for Black Girls, not only the website to find mental health specialists um, with similar backgrounds and cultures, but also their podcast that discusses mental health um, in ways that are central to um, Black women and birthing people or people capable of pregnancy. So not just medication or therapy, but I mean, I love the sessions about yoga and meditation and mindfulness and sound baths and movement and support groups, just all the things that we as clinicians should be aware of to be able to discuss them with our clients and not just a referral to a therapist that they may or may not be able to see and who knows when they will be able to see them. So that's my spiel. Uh, and then I, I'll turn it, turn it over. 
No, that's fantastic. Shout out to uh, Dr. Joy and Therapy for Black Girls. I was recently on there to your point. I mean, she has a great, a few great episodes about this very issue um, of Black women in motherhood, maternal uh, health. And also, um, I just did an episode about Black women in the law and all of the anxiety, stress, and um, mental health challenges that come with that. So I highly recommend it as well. Therapy for Black Girls. We will put that in the resource guide. Speaking of resources, um, after um, this conversation ends, everybody that is on this call, that is on this uh, in this conversation will receive an email with this full recording along with additional resources. So that is all coming your way. Uh, Dr. McCullough, I do wanna ask you, as we go to this uh, final part of the conversation, which is, you know, we laid some foundational information around the maternal uh, health crisis of black women and black persons giving birth in America. We talked a bit about best practices we got to go into policy. Um, we know that ultimately policy and broader legislation, le legislative changes rather, have got to be a part of this solution. Can you speak about your perspective around what policy uh, additives could make your work and your practice and what you see in this um, scope uh, have better outcomes for Black women and Black persons giving birth? Thank you very much uh, for that question. There, there are a number of things um, that can be done policy-wide. And um, as mentioned previously, uh, having access, access to healthcare, um, access to insurance. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of our, um, a lot of folks in our, in our population are not covered uh, by insurance. Um, some of them are covered by Medicaid, which is very limited. Um, so changing the policy where your Medicaid ends within six weeks or so of delivering, that needs to be changed where, um, you know, birth in uh, people are covered for at least one year out uh, from uh, delivery. You know, not only is that important for mom's health, but also for the newborn. Um, you know, our community suffers from very high um, uh, infant mortality and uh, expanding Medicaid to, inc uh, to include uh, moms and baby for at least a year out from delivery would make a huge difference. Uh, I'll also mention that uh, as far as uh, racism, uh, you know, structured racism uh, in, in the way we deliver care. And uh, that starts in medical school as well. Uh, an example of that is we're working with um, the New York City Health Department on a, a, a program that's called CIRCA, which is um, ending uh, a race-based uh, <clears throat> race and uh, some algorithm that we use in medicine, one of which is uh, for uh, evaluating women for trial of labor for after cesarean section. A big part of that calculation is race. When you add black race to this uh, to this algorithm, it, inc it decreases um, your ability to undergo trial of labor. And that's extremely important because the more cesarean section you have, the greater the risk of having uh, hemorrhage and death, significant morbidity after uh, uh, delivery, after cesarean section. So eliminating race uh, from these uh, 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 algorithm will go a long way, not only race, but also obesity. Unfortunately, our community uh, also suffers from, you know, high incidences of obesity. And if you're including that in your calculation as to whether or not you'll allow a, a, someone to undergo trial of labor after cesarean section, that's going to group a lot of our uh, folks into having repeat cesarean section, which increases their chance for severe morbidity and mortality. So there, there's a lot that needs to be done, um, not only locally, but also uh, nationally. As I mentioned previously, you know, changing the way we, that we provide prenatal care as well as postpartum care uh, will, if it's, uh, 
implemented will assist in decreasing or mortality or morbidity rate in African American women. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for that, Dr. McCullough. So as I promised, we are going to your fantastic audience questions. Um, the first question I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to start with uh, Ms. Uh, Monroe. Um, this question came up early in the conversation. I want to go way back in the archives here. Here it is. Um, and this is a question. I'm going to find it where an audience member was asking how best to help deal with um, the gaslighting of white practitioners uh, mm -hmm. when mothers or persons giving birth talk about pain that they're enduring or other symptoms and they're not being believed. Um, here it is, medical gaslighting, um, medical apartheid even. Uh, can you talk a bit about how those factors play into uh, Black women not receiving the care they need? Mm -hmm. So it depends on who the audience is, right? I think um, we have to educate um, providers. Um, and, you know, bias is not just for white people either. I think, you know, um, practitioners of color also need to examine themselves and examine their um, implicit bias, mm -hmm. right? If you have a brain, you have implicit bias, right? We all, um, you know, as we progress through life, we we experience different things that just, um, you know, we have traumas, uh, you know, economic status can cause us to, to look down on someone of the same color. Um, the way someone speaks, how they smell, whether or not there's roaches, you know, um, uh, you know, that's in the in the baby car seat. All of these things we need to think about. Um, and, you know, even, so I want to go into to, to trust. Trust is really important. And, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of people don't access care because of lack of trust, but medical care, you have to access, you're forced to access it. So a, a hospital, a medical center is a great place to, to reach people and connect with them so that you can um, provide, you know, preventive care. And so when you have uh, people who are afraid to come to a medical center because, um, you know, there might be a call to ACS if they share too much information, right? Um, that's an issue. That's an issue because if they're not sharing their social issues so that we can include it in their overall care plan, then we're missing out on an opportunity to really help them. So we need to look at that. We need to look at the reasons why um, Black mothers are reported to ACS on a, on a, a much uh, higher rate than um, you know, women who are of other color or, or not, of non-color <laughs> or white women. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I can't help but be thinking about that married black couple in Texas mm -hmm. whose uh, infant child was taken away from them. I think that child remains in foster care or some type of service. Uh, no, is it the child being returned home? The child has been returned home. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That, you know, awful, awful, awful situation. So thank you for that, Ms. Monroe. Um, Chanel, I actually do want to come to you with this next question. Uh, this is from Savoy Hutchinson, who asks, how do Black people finance the cost of a doula? Not everybody has insurance coverage. So first, I, I kind of want to backtrack just a little bit and just um, kind of veggie back off of Roxanne and Dr. Cyrus. And so um, just in terms of patients being able to advocate for themselves. There is a document that the New York City Department of Health came out with um, that I, you know, helped to co-design, which is the Respectful Care at Birth uh, document, right? Which really talks about um, informed consent, education, you know, having the right to bodily autonomy. What does it mean for someone to advocate for themselves and to really center their birthing experience 
prior to them even entering into a hospital-based institution. And while the document is very good and it offers a lot of information and knowledge, it is also important to incorporate education where we have a culture shift within hospital-based institutions, right? And so it is not the sole responsibility of the patient to be able to educate and have to advocate for themselves every time they go into a birthing experience. I did see someone who said that they were a mom of four. And as a mother of six, I totally agree. Um, that you should be centered in you as being the expert within your care, right? Because since you have been birthed into this world, everything that has happened to you um, in relation to your reproductive health care and your reproductive health access impacts the way in which you bring your child into the world. And so that has to really be uplifted and centered in the conversation. I also want to lift up Dr. James and, you know, just saying how the the power dynamics needs to shift, right? In terms of, in relation to understanding how people are centering one another um, within conversations. And then in, 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 in all actuality, what people are really saying is, I need you to see my humanity. I need you to see that I exist, um, that I am a person who is experiencing different things. And it's not just about my episode of pregnancy that is happening to me. It goes far beyond that. And then that's where we get into the postpartum care, right? And so when we're talking about policy and policy reform on the state level, you know, New York State has the opportunity right now to implement doula Medicaid reimbursement. In 2018, it was a pilot that was uh, that took place in Erie County, which wasn't really successful in terms of when you think about the the larger dynamic in an urban population because that was really up in a rural area, right? And um, so now the the you know New York State Medicaid has an opportunity to you know reimburse doulas at a rate of 1930, as well as set a, aside a 10 million dollar allocation towards budgeting. But what has happened is that the governor has stalled on budget, um, the budget right now. So it's been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the budget has not been approved as yet. And so we're really in this fight to really say, listen, you know, like doulas are doing amazing work. And if you're uplifting the, the narrative of doulas and while I think doulas are amazing and I am a doula, that is not the only solution to a bigger problem. We are only a small microcosm <laughs> within a big pool of a situation where we really need to look at how we are structuring um, maternal health in general. On a national level, the reason why people are so confused, I think, about the ways in which I had to even access care is because policies vary from hospital to hospital, from state to state, right? You could have a hospital in Brooklyn, they're right across the street from each other, and they have two different policies on how they're going to center and care for someone. That is really confusing, right? It's like trying to like, when you're looking for a college and you're trying to find where you want to go. Um I also want to say that there have been policies initiatives that have been uplifted on a federal level, such like the extension of postpartum Medicaid for up to one year. There are certain states that have adopted that, um, but there are also states that also have other reproductive health restrictions that are going on right now who have not ado adopted the extension of postpartum Medicaid for up to one year. Um, paid family leave, right? And so, yes, I can bring a child into the world, but can I be supported once a child gets here? Right. And what does that look like for me to center myself and for my family? But then also looking at the Momnibus Act. And so the Momnibus Act was an act that was introduced by Rep. Lauren Underwood and Alma Adams. Right. Um, there is the Mamas Act that was introduced by Vice President Kamala Harris. And that those 12 bills within the Momnibus Act are really ways to really galvanize the issues that everyone is talking about here, how to develop and build up the perinatal workforce, how to address the discrepancies in terms of education for providers, right? There's a Kara Johnson Act, there's the Veterans Act that's in there. So there's it's a very comprehensive package of bills that is really set aside. And, you know, at this point, it's, you know, the, it's going to be reintroduced. And so you as a consumer, and I'm calling patients consumers, because I want you to know that this is a business, you have the right to advocate for these things. And it really is going to take um, all of us being involved in the conversation. You don't have to be this huge advocate. You don't have to do the most. Just having a conversation with someone and passing on information is you being an advocate and really centering the conversation and, and providing hope right, to someone, especially in the context of what it means to raise Black children in a world that doesn't necessarily see them as well. Um, and so I really wanted to uplift all of that um, so that people had tangible resources and action items that they can follow 
um, as they leave out of the conversation and don't feel like, oh my goodness, like, well, I know they said there was hope, but where's the hope at? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Hope and change, hope and change. Wow. I'm just holding space. Um, I, I, I do feel um, that as consumers, and we are just that, we are consumers um, of this thing called American health care and maternal care in this conversation. Um, we need to uh, be zealous advocates around uh, that packaging and that that policy um, that you just described, Chanel. And, and I really just feel, want to say that we could be here I could be here for two more hours unpacking uh, the, the nature of this conversation. So much to talk about. What I'm taking from it, though, is it like you said, it's not one solution. It's not just doulas. It's not just uh, midwives. It's not just uh, educating clinicians. This is a holistic issue and it has to be approached and remedied as such. That is all the time that we have this evening. Um, I do look forward to all of us continuing these conversations within our communities, within our workplaces, and within our various organizations that we touch. I've got to thank each and every one of our panelists this evening for your time and your expertise and, and just your brilliance and your humanity. Uh, I want to thank our, our sponsors this evening. That includes the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. I want to thank One Brooklyn Health and, of course, NYU Mixed Silver Institute. Um, and then all of our community sponsors as well. We could not do this without you. Uh, special, special thanks to Dr. Nanette Thomas at One Brooklyn Health for her invaluable support. Uh, as well as a big thank you to Dr. Damali Wilson, Meg Bayer, Lisa Frank, and the rest of NYU Mix Silver uh, and their team for just an extraordinary collaborative effort to make tonight possible. And for each and every one of you audience members, you guys could be anywhere on a Tuesday night and you're here with us and we appreciate that. Uh, Rose, 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 my darling Rose, none of this would have happened without your vision and your execution and your leadership. Uh, it has been my honor uh, to spend time moderating this very important transformational conversation uh, for Black communities. Thank you all. Have a fantastic evening. Good night. <laughs>